so I'm a, a tech reporter, if you guys didn't know that yet. Um, and <clears throat> you'd think that using the internet and computers to create and spend money would just kind of click for me. It doesn't at all. Um, I'm not ashamed to admit that I don't understand Bitcoin um, at all. And so we're very lucky actually to have this next panel coming up. It's called Magical Internet Currency Navigating Bitcoin. So Kim Mike Cutler, our TechCrunch writer, is going to talk to Peter Smith from Blockchain and Susan Athey from Stanford University. Please welcome them to the stage. So we've actually discussed Bitcoin at a few Disrupt conferences. Um, and when I was looking at the space about a year ago, it was sort of, it was sort of the first time that a lot of VCs were kind of piping up about it as a potential, like, you know, a good investment. We sort of see Chris Dixon and Lightspeed and others. Um, and a year on from that, you know, we ha now have a number of Bitcoin startups that are incredibly well funded, and there have been some very high profile, like, upswings and then collapses. <laughs> well, not collapses, but. Um, so I wanted to kind of bring the conversation again here to New York um, to kind of get a sense of, well, where are we now? Um, so when, I, you know, when you look at Bitcoin and where it's trading today, it's like about roughly half of where it was pre-Gox. Um, so I just wanted to get, you know, let's open discussion with that. Is this kind of lull that we're seeing, is it different or is it just something that's typical to you know, the history of Bitcoin, which has spiked and dropped and spiked and dropped so many times. Sure, so I'll, so I'll start by saying that, you know, I think it, the focus on the exchange rate is a little overrated. I mean, it's yeah. fun to watch the price move around, but if I want to send funds to you, say, in Japan, um, I only care about the Bitcoin exchange rate for about 10 minutes. You yeah. know, I'm going to take my dollars, buy some Bitcoins, I can send you some Bitcoins. If you're worried about the exchange rate, you should cash them right out. Yeah. So the level of the exchange rate is really irrelevant for its use as a transaction medium. Yeah, and, and as a professor at uh, GSB at Stanford, you've been doing some research looking into the blockchain and transactions on there. Um, and you were telling me earlier that you, you found the price behavior actually efficient, to be efficient when you look at the amount of transaction volume that's happening on the network. Sure. I mean, one, one kind of question people often ask is, well, couldn't the exchange rate just be anything? Like, it, it has no intrinsic value, so what pins it down? And of course, if you look at the price of gold, the, the price of gold also reflects the fact that people are using it as a store of value and so on. So it's not just the, the base value. It's got a premium associated with how it's being used. And so, in some sense, the Bitcoin is all premium about how it's being used. If you think about tr trying to move money around, there's, you can think of the number of Bitcoins as like a pipe of yeah. sort of fixed dimension. And if I want to put a lot of dollar value through that pipe, then the exchange rate from dollars to Bitcoins has to grow mm -hmm. in order to accommodate moving that, that, that volume through the pipe. And so when you look, out, look back over the transaction volumes and the exchange rates, they actually track each other reasonably closely. How with, closely? Um, you know, it's, we, there, there was some deviations around uh, Christmas time when the price was up at about 1,000. There you saw sort of some deviations from historical trends, but actually if you think of a, a velocity of about five annually, you're able to predict pretty well what the prices would be as a function of the transaction volume. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, not perfectly, but, but qualitatively the movements are, are actually fairly predictable. So if you know what the transaction volume will be, you can roughly understand the prices. That's, that's a, it's not a perfect formula because, of course, you have to understand, well, what caused the transaction volumes to go up to start with? Yeah. Uh, but, but roughly, the, the market seems to be working the way you might expect. Okay. So, Peter, where, where are we now? Gox files for bankruptcy. It's the largest, very public set of losses. What does that mean for the rest of the Bitcoin startup ecosystem? Yeah, I think for the most part, the impact will be relatively small. I think what Mt. Gox does bring up is sort of the historical difference on philosophy about how startups use the Bitcoin protocol. So you, broadly you have two buckets. You have startups that centralize control of the Bitcoins that they have from their customers. So this means that when I send my Bitcoins to Mt. Gox, Mt. Gox is hypothetically 
moving them into a master account that they control mm -hmm. versus startups that, for example, build software that makes it easy for average consumers to safely and securely store their bitcoins. This would be a startup, for example, like blockchain. So blockchain, we only build open source software that allows users to more effectively and more securely manage their own funds. We never take possession of the funds. And over the course of Bitcoin, there's been a long running kind of split between businesses that do business that way and businesses that centralize trust. You know, for me personally, I wouldn't want to trust anyone with my Bitcoins or anyone with my money more broadly. Because why would I? Why would I trust someone when I don't have to? When the technology is easy, it's available, and it's free to manage my own funds. Now, secondly, on a very real level, the issue is that over the long curve of Bitcoin history, which is only a couple years, we're still very much in the infancy, almost all services that have centralized that trust have eventually experienced a mass theft or a massive loss. So Mt. Gox is not the first. Um, Bitcoinica, Bitfloor, MyBitcoin, which was a wallet service, Inputs.io. Do you, do you think this next generation of startups, like I'm thinking like Circle, which is run by Jeremy O'Leary, and you know he's has a really decorated history, or like Zappa, which is funded by Benchmark. I mean, these feel like startups that are run by like a different caliber of management teams that so, that are different than Gox. I mean, you kind of put me in a difficult position because you're asking me to publicly <laughs> on other executives. Um, but what I will say is that every sort of new generation of Bitcoin startups is hailed as the, the arrival of the professionals. Mm -hmm. You know, in the case of Jeremy Allaire, he's um, accomplished more in life than, than most of us will. Um, so I, I think that he's going to do great things in the space. But I have no idea what their business model is or how their technology works. In the case of Zappo, they centralize trust. Mm -hmm. And I don't think business models that take away the core value proposition of the Bitcoin protocol are a good idea. Um, and, and speaking of you guys, as well, you have the largest number of consumer wallets. Right. We have the, the most. Like, um, more than Coinbase and more than Correct. Zappo we, and we're approaching 1.6 million um, users on the consumer wallet side. We have the most popular API in the space but that enterprise users use. Everyone else has taken some giant, you know, $20 million round of funding or whatever it is, but you guys haven't. Is it, it, why, why not? Well, I mean, this is a question that we're constantly asked. Like, when are you going to raise money? Why haven't you raised money already? And I'm going to circle something back to what Fred Wilson said. And he said, we tell entrepreneurs to think, what is the point of the money? What are you trying to do with it? To date, we haven't needed institutional money. Mm -hmm. We make money every single month. We're a revenue positive business. We run slightly cash positive, And we've managed to build out a team of 20 people solely on that revenue stream. And we've managed to manage hyper growth. We've managed to massively expand our infrastructure. Um, I mean, we, we seriously do quite significant revenue. So after Gox, what's, what's the responsibility of all the other companies in the ecosystem to engender trust in, in, in Bitcoin and other altcoins? I'm, gonna, I'm just going to quickly, and then I'll let you do it. Yeah. From a, so from an industry perspective and not very neutral perspective, sorry about the mic thing, um, I think that we have to do a better job of educating consumers of the differences between the different types of services. Just backstage, I was actually explaining to somebody from TechCrunch, actually, the difference between centralized, you know, wallet services like Mt. Gox or, or whatever else, and you know, services that allow you to control your own keys. So I think that generally we have to do a much better job of educating consumers. But I think as an industry, we need to be much more committed to consumer protection than we already are. You know, as That's an like industry, an individual <laughs> vow that you're making as an individual company, and maybe there's kind of an organization that represents a number of companies. Like after Gox happened. Um, you know, a bunch of companies, I can't remember exactly, but there was a list of them that made a statement. But it, it, like beyond that, beyond a, you making an individual prompt, yeah. Blockchain's okay, so you guys were in that. I we can't were a key part of that okay. in, uh, initiative, actually. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and actually one of our employees went and, and audited one of the major 
um, startups that centralizes storage of Bitcoin to calm fears in the wake of the hack. Yeah. So we have remained deeply committed to that. You know, I think the industry as a whole could do a much better job. Is, is, is that, does that mean you have an organization representing all of you, or does that mean how do regulators need to get involved? Do they need to get involved? If so, how? I, I'd like to see the Bitcoin Foundation take a more active role in this front. Yeah. Um, you know, they've done a variety of great work on the regulatory level, you know, around money laundering um, and that kind of stuff. I'd like to see them take a much more proactive role on consumer protection and on self-regulation. Yeah, I'd say that you know the consumer protection angle is one of the angles that um, opponents to Bitcoin have been using to lobby U.S. regulators. Um, you know, and so the, in that sense, things like Mt. Gox can be problematic because they make legislators and regulators nervous, and it makes these sort of um, anti-virtual currency lobby more effective. But I think what, on the flip side of that, if I believe if you actually want to protect consumers that having the industry be able to function and flourish in the United States is very important because the venture community here is very well developed. Yeah. We, have, we have organizations that have legal expertise, financial regulation expertise, as well as expertise in just how you actually manage an exchange safely. And if you think about you know, what these exchanges are trying to do, you know, they're operating in an environment with very wildly fluctuating volumes, with very high, fluctuating exchange rates, um, lots of, of things that get people excited and see mass inflows as well as outflows. And so to manage that kind of a financial services business on a shoestring of a small number of people as a startup is quite challenging. I think that if we have the, the infrastructure of the US VC community behind some of these exchanges and other types of businesses, they will be safer for consumers. I just want to emphasize, though, that um, you know, consumers don't have to keep large sums of money in these centralized organizations. So if you think, like, who was actually losing money on Mt. Gox? Well, it had been a year since you couldn't get dollars out of Mt. Yeah. Gox. Um, you know, they'd had a couple of episodes of you know, freezing withdrawals. If you just did an internet search on them, you would see immediately in the top results you know, complaints and problems. So people who were, you know, big people who were holding large balances on Mt. Gox were mostly day trading.